I've gotten to know you the last two years. And you might have known me even before that when I was volunteering in the junior high. So my name is Josh Jacobs. I'm one of the junior high pastors here. I'm also the adult pastor here at Eastview. And I just love being able to spend time with you guys this morning in a place that means so much to me. And before that, I want to give a special shout out to the junior high small group that I used to lead when I was a junior high leader. And then when I came on staff, I didn't get to lead them anymore. But Hudson, Brody, Colin... Rocky, Seth, Jared, Jesse, Jason, Benjamin, and Noah, and they usually sit up here in the top on Sunday mornings, and they're all juniors now, and it's just crazy to me to think about all the things that God is doing in you and through you, and it's just so awesome to see you guys this morning. So if you guys want to go ahead and open up your Bibles to John chapter 7, that is where we're going to be landing for the most part today. We'll be referring to Leviticus like we have for the, most of the summer, but I want you to turn your attention to John chapter 7. Well, the last time I preached in here was my last day of being a student in student ministry. I was a senior in high school, and it was Senior Sunday, and the old high school pastor, Matt Vogel, asked if I would preach that Sunday, and I was extremely nervous going into it. I think it was like a 10-minute sermon because I just said everything super fast, and I was just like, I'm, I'm going to get over it super quick. And you can even see Cooper in the back. He's probably filming some Instagram story or something right there. But it's just so cool to be in this space once again, four and a half years later with you guys, I look at the space and I think of all the memories I had as a high school student. I think of the Sunday mornings I got to be in here and worship alongside other, junior, or other high school students. I think of the small group I was in and the amazing community I got to have with other Christ followers in high school. Or think of the summer trips I got to go on, like you guys got to go on the summer trip or summer camp this past summer. And the amazing experiences that God can use in that. And I share all these things not to be that guy who talks about his high school days, because we all know those people in our lives who like to tell you how high school was for them. But I share this because I want to tell you that you are a part of an amazing ministry. The high school team here is incredible. I get to work alongside them every week, but I also got to experience firsthand as a student the power of this ministry. So Rich, Kim, Cooper, Zach, Mel, Bree, Aleska, they all love Jesus deeply and care for each of you more than you will ever know. And I think the ministry partners like John, or Jim and Gonzo and Dale and Ratasha and the hundreds of other volunteers that serve in this ministry because they love you that much. And so if we could just give a hand real quick to this amazing high school team and way to prepare and love you guys. But if we're being honest, I know you all miss Felicia, Matt, and I more than that, though. So you can come back to the junior high anytime if you want. But today we're going to be spending our last Sunday before on purpose. We're going to be, again, in John chapter 7. And we're going to be talking about one of the final feasts that we haven't covered here. If you know anything about Jesus, he loves to look back to the Old Testament and talk about how it proclaims his glory, proclaims who he is through the rest of time. And so that's what we find here in John chapter 7. If you can go ahead and open your Bibles there, if you haven't already, verse 37 is where we'll be beginning today. On that last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And John writes, when he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not entered into his glory. Father, we thank you for your presence in this space. We thank you for the promise of your spirit from long ago and the outpour you've given to us as believers. And so, Father, as we listen to your word, will you convict us, will you teach us, will you point us in the direction of your son? In your name we pray. Amen. So a bit of context here for this moment that is going on in John. The Jewish people were celebrating one of the three major yearly feasts. So some of you have probably heard of Passover before. Some of you have probably heard of Pentecost before. But there's a third yearly feast that they would celebrate every year called the Feast of of the tabernacles. You can even see it in Leviticus chapter 23. Long ago, God commanded Moses to tell the people of God this. And the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Begin celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles on the 15th day of the appointed month, five days after the Day of Atonement. This festival to the Lord will last seven days. 
So for seven days, the Jewish people would leave their towns. A lot of them would pilgr- might take a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Even if they lived far away, they would make the journey. And they would set up tents for seven days. And they would spend seven days in these tents, reflecting and remembering God's presence among them. God's provision for them in the wilderness long ago, and the way he cared for them. And they would also celebrate this promise from God, from in the Old Testament, that one day he would come and overflow his spirit onto them. It hadn't happened yet. And so yearly they would come to this place and they would celebrate the promise that one day God's spirit would come upon them. Wouldn't that be an amazing day? The priest would go to the pool of Shalom and he would take a pitcher of water and he would fill it. And thousands of Jewish people would follow him all the way back up to the altar as he would pour it onto the altar to represent God's spirit pouring on them. Isaiah in verse, uh, chapter 44 verse 3 even predicts this. He says, for I will pour out the water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. John himself claimed that Jesus was the fulfillment of this feast. If you remember, if you've ever read John chapter 1 before, in verse 14, he says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt and the word tabernacle can be used interchangeably because the tabernacle was God's literal dwelling place among his people in the Old Testament. So what John said just a few chapters before this is that Jesus came to dwell among us. Do you see what's happening here? Jesus stands up during this festival about this time when God is going to bring his presence among man. And he stands up and says, I am the fulfillment of that. I am the one you have been looking for. I am the promise of God being fulfilled right now. What we find in this first verse here in John chapter 7 is Jesus blesses all who believe in him with rivers of living water. Jesus proclaimed in this moment to the crowd who had been walking past him for seven days, asking God to pour out his spirit upon them, that he was the literal fulfillment of that promise. That the day had come that God's spirit would come and Jesus was here to be among them. And this promise It wasn't exclusive either, right? Look at the verse again. Jesus doesn't say, come to me all who are religious, or come to me anyone who's got it all together, or come to me who you deem worthy. No. Jesus says, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone. And some of you in this space today may not feel like you are worthy of that. You might hear that word anyone, you might have heard these promises of God before, and you might think, yeah, that applies to everyone except me. You might look at yourself or look at your own life and think, yeah, there's no way that God could actually mean that for me. Why would God want to give me living water? Speaking of water. But earlier in John, Jesus encounters a woman at the well whose society would have deemed the least of these, whose society would have said, you are the most unworthy of God, of his presence. And he tells her in the middle of the day that I have come to be the fulfillment of this promise. I have come to bring living water to you. This promise is for everyone, but there is one condition to this. That Jesus says here in verse 33, there is one condition that Jesus requires us for us to experience his living water. In verse 37, it says, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. To experience the living water of God, you must be thirsty for him. You must be thirsty for God. In Psalm uh, 42.1, it says, As a deer pants for the water, brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. David says in Psalm 63.1, O God, you are my God, I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. In Revelation 21.6, Jesus says, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. You might be thinking, okay, that's easy, right? It's easy to be thirsty for something. That's the easy part of it, right? But the issue is that our sin has gotten in the way of that. 
for some of us in this space or some people you may know, you may not even realize you need God. You may go through your days, you may go through your weeks and do life on your own and never realizing that eternal thirst you need for God. You're not thirsty for him yet. I hear sometimes people talk about why they're leaving the church and sometimes they'll say, I don't need it anymore. I don't, I don't need Jesus. What, do you, what does he have to offer me? They don't know the eternal thirst that they have for him. Or maybe you've been trying to fulfill that thirst with other things. Maybe you've been trying to throw popularity into that God-shaped hole in your heart, or self-image, or success, or power, money, drugs, alcohol, mind-numbing ga video games, or endless scrolling. And if that's what you're trying to fill your heart with, you won't experience the living water. You must be thirsty for God. Students, we must recognize our deep need for God today. We must become thirsty for God. But don't hear me saying becoming thirsty for God is cleaning up your life. That's not the same thing. Being thirsty for God is recognizing your need for him and coming to him. Think about it like this. We're, if you're outside working on a really hot day one time, maybe you do some yard work for your parents sometimes, and you've been out there for hours, and the beating sun is upon you, and you're sweating, and you're just dripping, and all you need is some water or something. And from inside the house, whoever it is just yells out to you, hey, we've got water and fresh lemonade for you. Just come inside and get it, whatever you want. It's up to you. You come get it. It, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize all you have to do is walk inside to get the water, right? That thirst you have in your soul for it. Are you thirsty, students? Are you wanting what Jesus has to offer to you? The same is true with Jesus. When we are all thirsty, whether you recognize it or not, and we all are in desperate need of what Jesus has to offer us, and all you have to do to receive that living water is to come to him. Just come. Just go to Jesus and ask him for a drink. The statement, come to me, implies that Jesus wants a personal relationship with you. It's an invitation. It's not a tryout. He's not asking you to be good enough. He's not asking you to measure up. He's just asking you to come in this moment and to experience living water. So right now, will you, you can do that right now. Will you do that? Will you open yourself up to God in this moment and say, God, speak to me? God, let me drink from the well of living water. Will you approach the throne of God daily, asking for that water through reading scripture or praying or spending time with worshiping with music or in silence and solitude or whatever that looks like for you to connect with God? Will you seek the living water by being in community with other Christians, doing life with other high schoolers and other adults who want to pour into you and letting Jesus speak to you through them? Will you come? High school students, will you come to Jesus today? And you may be wondering what exactly this living water is that Jesus has to offer, right? Sometimes there's these metaphors in scripture that we throw out there, like living water, and you're like, okay, but what is living water? Well, John literally spells it out for us in verse 39. He writes this later because John is writing this gospel after the account, and he says, when he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit, who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. The rivers of living water is the Holy Spirit. This is the fulfillment of the Feast of the Tabernacles. This is the fulfillment of Jesus' life and ministry. Jesus came down to earth, and he proclaimed the kingdom of God, and he lived a perfect and sinless life. And then he died, and then he rose again. Not just so we could go somewhere one day, but so that we could experience his presence right now. Through Jesus' resurrection and our faith in him, God can make his dwelling place in you. In the Old Testament, you had to go to the tabernacle, you had to go through all of these steps to be able to even come close to God's presence. But through Jesus' sacrifice, we have become temples of the Holy Spirit. That's what the New Testament says. That our bodies are God's dwelling place. And that he wants to live in you. He 
He wants to be with you. He wants to be near you. The story of the Bible, the story of Jesus can be seen as the rescue mission from God to remove hell from our souls and to put heaven inside. Heaven is being in the presence of God forever. That is eternity. That is the promise of God is his presence with us forever. Do you want to experience that today? Do you want to be a part of that today? Salvation is not just a place where we go when we die, but it's an eternal transformation of our souls, bringing us back to the Garden of Eden where God dwelt with us. It is experiencing the living water. Do you want that today? This living water, the Holy Spirit that has blessed us, it goes to all who believe in him. It's the beginning of what eternity looks like. We live in the space between the here where, where Jesus' spirit is within us and the not yet, the kingdom of God is not fully here yet. But we get to see glimpses of heaven all the time. If you're familiar with Galatians 5 at all, Paul talks about all of the sins that separate us from God, that take us out of God's presence. But then he lists the fruits of the Spirit, the things that bring us closer to God, the things that show us who God is, right? Like love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Our souls are not fixed, they are formed. And over time, the more we reflect the fruits of the Spirit in our world, the more our souls will be formed and shaped into who Jesus created us to be. And one day, there will be a fulfillment of that in eternity. But until then, daily, you get the chance to experience what God has for you right now. Not by our own power, but by the power of the living Spirit within you. But that begs the question, why? Why? Why does God give us his Holy Spirit? Why does God give us rivers of living water overflowing from our lives? And that's because Jesus blesses all who believe in him with rivers of living water so that we will be satisfied in him and that we will become a source of blessing to others. Water is needed for survival, right? We can't, we can't live, I think it's like two to three days before you have another drink of water or else you'll dehydrate and die, right? You need water to survive. God uses this image of water throughout the Old Testament to talk about his blessings to his people and the way he provides for his people. Water is a picture of our physical needs being met. But this living water, this Holy Spirit, is a picture of our eternal needs being met, our spiritual need that can't be met by anything this world has to offer, the Spirit can fulfill that. Jesus supplies us with this never-ending Spirit to carry us through this life and beyond. The Spirit alone is what satisfies, satisfies our eternal needs, and not only does it satisfy our eternal needs, but if you spend enough time with Jesus, if you become overcome by His Spirit, Eventually, that's going to pour out to others. Think about the world around you right now. Doesn't it seem chaotic, broken, in desperate need of something more than what it has to offer right now? The world is a dry desert, and it needs living water. I think of this past year and a half, for two years at this point, I don't even know what COVID has done to us. It has wreaked havoc on physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of so many people. Maybe you in this room right now have felt the ramifications of that. There are people who need living water. I think of what's going on in Afghanistan right now, and there's people whose lives are on the line every single day, and the only thing that they can cling to is the hope of living water. Or there's thousands of places around the world right now where they struggle every single day to see their needs being met. Maybe some of you have been to those places or maybe you've seen them before from the news or from or you've heard about from someone else. They need the living water. I think of the division and hatred in our world right now. You see it in your schools. You see it in your community. You see it in your state and in your country and around the world. There's people from all sorts of viewpoints who are just dividing and hating toward one another. They need living water. 
I think of our culture and the ways that we've tried to say that, that we can find our identity and our followers or our sexual desires or orientation or drugs or money or fame or power. Our culture is thirsty for something that will last. Eternal water. Rivers of living water. There are students in this room right now who are desperate for living water. They might be sitting next to you right now. And I can guarantee you there's students in your schools, maybe it's your third hour class, that need the living water now. And you know what? That's why Jesus fills you with living water. So that may overflow to those around you. Because when we follow Jesus, when we allow him to take control of our lives, and when we submit our will to his, that's when others around us will begin to experience the living water. <laughs> Students, you can go through high school looking for temporary things to fill your needs. Been there, done that. And I'm going to tell you, as someone that's four to five years removed from it now, it won't last. You're not going to remember the things in sophomore year that carried you through and you thought would fill you. One day that will pass away and something new will have to fill its place. But right now, in this moment, and every day to come, you have the opportunity to seek something eternal for yourself and for those around you. Will you be satisfied by the living water that is offered to you through Jesus today? All he says is come. Come to me, all who are thirsty, and I will give you rivers of living water. So I invite all of you to stand, and we're going to do something real quick. I would love if we could pray this prayer together. And I invite you, and I even challenge you to write this down, take a picture of it, or at least think of it in your mind for later in the week. That as we think about the ways that God will come touch this real quick to remove it. Thank you. <laughs> As we think of the ways that God could be pouring out his living water among us, let this be our testimony as we go into our schools this week. Let this be the testimony of our lives. So you pray this with me? Oh. <laughs> Tough. I'm just giving you guys some time. All right, will you guys pray this with me? Lord, fill me with your spirit and flow out of me toward those who may be thirsty. Amen.